Just a couple words about my background and why this may be of interest to me. I was not reared a Christian. In our family, we called upon spirits and we saw strange things happen. So when I watch a movie like Stranger Things <laughs> on TV, I'm saying, okay, I've heard this before. <clears throat> Over the course of the decades, so Jennifer and I together have lived 15 years in three different African countries where all of our neighbors daily were dealing with the spirit world. And so we had to not only understand what the Bible says about the unseen world, we also had to learn from our neighbors what they were experiencing and how they described it and even learn their vocabulary for it. I remember the day when a mother said to her small child about me, stay away from that man. He is a soul-eating demon. <laughs> and the kid, oh man, was he worried. I worked as a church planting trainer in 20 countries, Asia and Africa mainly, but some in Latin America. And in all of these countries, all of the Christians are dealing with the spirit world in a way that most of us Americans have never had to do, especially if we were reared in, either as Christians or in a school system that taught us to think rationally about reality. Here we are at Powellhurst Baptist Church in autumn of 2022. A brief description of what I intend this class to be, but we always have the freedom to change it. So in this course, we participants will examine the various kinds of invisible beings named in the Bible. Their origin, their authority, their deeds, and many ways in which they influence our life on earth. I invite questions, <coughs> objections, and comments. Just be aware that we only have an hour. <laughs> so here's your facilitator. Uh, you can contact me anytime you want at galen at curra.com or ring me up or send me a text. And your private communications is invited and will be kept confidential. Unless I forget to tell somebody. <laughs> well, I am going to ask homework of each of you. Uh, I will be doing the same thing to read a chapter of the book Supernatural before each class. These chapters are short, four to six pages or so, but the content is stimulating, but does require careful thought. You can always download the lessons and the outline we're following, and even these slides I'm making from this site, galencurra.online. That will take you to the documents. You can download them into your computer, print them out, or whatever you wish. Forward them to others. Everything will be <coughs> Then bring your observations, questions, and objections. And then we're recommending, as we said, the book Supernatural. Uh, it's only $6 for Kindle. No, I got it for free. Free on pdfdrive.com. Yes, it's there too. You can get it free if you like reading on your computer. A number of us may not be comfortable with computers. But you can also get a free download in a number of other languages at that site. Now we come to today's lesson. We'll call this the, the introductory lesson. I have objectives for this morning. Learning objectives and experiential objectives and outcome objectives. <coughs> what we expected our students to be able to do when they left the course. I would like us to know the categories, nature, and functions of spiritual beings. Secondly, I want us to understand something. <coughs> namely, that Bible writers believe in a spiritual realm as did the entire ancient world, and as does probably 90% of the world to this day. Now this is a particular challenge to North American white folk who go as missionaries to other parts of the world, because we don't go with the biblical supernatural dimension of the gospel. We go with a set of ideas and propositions about who was Jesus? What did he do on earth? What did he teach? How he died, rose again from death, has ascended into heaven, and we're waiting for him to return. And you know what? If you will trust in him, he will forgive your sins. Not realizing that in many cultures of the world, sin is not considered a big problem. That's just human nature. But there are other things that Jesus accomplished in the spirit world that are very interesting to them. 
especially how that he gained victory over all evil spirits by his death on the cross. Now, evangelical North Americans seldom, if ever, talk about that fact because we are a guilt-oriented society. And so finding forgiveness or release from guilt, it's important to us. Many parts of the world, what is far more important is breaking the power of the spirit world. And Jesus does that very effectively. And other parts of the world is a question of shame. The communities that we lived in, if, for example, a young woman became pregnant and the family was disappointed, she'll probably throw herself down the well because the shame is so strong. And how does the Bible connect the cross of Jesus with shame? I'm sorry? He despised our shame. Uh, he despised the shame of the cross. And John said, he died so as so that when he appears, we will not be put to shame. So there are many facets of learning about the spirit world, of about the mentality of various peoples, and how the gospel applies to that. And thirdly, practice. My hope is that we'll never read the Bible in the same way again. Every time we open it, we're going to see there's teaching and truth on almost every page that our culture has blinded us to by teaching us from our childhood growing up that the only reality is what you can see, feel, smell, touch. And what's the other one? Taste. Taste. There's a document on, online. I'd like you to download it, but I'll give you the, the gist of it here in a moment. Titled First Testament Terminology for Spiritual Beings. What do I mean by the First Testament? The Old Testament. The Old Testament, yeah. What we call it. Is the Old Testament still valid? Yes. Amen. Very much so. Is it the Word of God? Yes. yes. Does God still operate by the principles of the Old Testament? Yes. yes. All the time. In fact, the Gospel is there too. And Jesus came and fulfilled that part. We'll deal with part of that document here in a moment. You can download it from that site that we mentioned earlier. All right, with one caveat about this class, somebody, some were worried about this. We shall not deal with ghost stories, demon encounters, fairy tales, or exorcism ceremonies, however real and valid they might be. How to live in, pray in, gain victory in, and penetrate peoples and nations and families with the gospel. Now, many of us in this room consider ourselves to be evangelicals. Evangelicals generally recognize three classes of spiritual beings. What is one of those? Angels. Angels is one of them. That's good. Seraphim. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But most folk would say those are also angels. angels. Okay. Demons. Uh, demons, right, okay, which we would say are some kind of angel. Angel, okay. <laughs> yeah, all right, you're getting it. Now, there's one big overriding class of spirit beings that you haven't mentioned yet. Human beings. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We, in fact, are we spiritual beings? Yes, who live in bodies. Most Christians would start off by saying, well, there's God. <laughs> He's a spiritual being. Oh, oh, and by the way, he came and lived in a, in a human body for a while. In fact, he's still in that human body, but much improved. All right, secondly, angels, and as you mentioned, thirdly, demons, sometimes called fallen angels. Stretch, stretch this further, when we read in the Bible about other gods, we generally think, what, well, first of all, most of us would consider gods to be imaginary beings, that only pagans believe to be real. And so when we see the word gods in the First Testament, we usually think of... False gods. Or false, false gods. Idols. Idols, right. I grew up under Hindu philosophy, and then when I went to India, which I've done a number of times, I kind of felt at home, <laughs> because on every, almost every street corner in the towns, there are idols set up in little temples. Folk coming by, they stop, they ring the bell, they get the spirit's attention and they leave an offering or something or mutter a prayer before the idol. And they understand what idols are. Idols are human-made abodes or dwellings for spirits. And if you make it really pretty and keep, take care of it and put little offerings in front of it, they will be glad to come dwell in the idol. 
and then you can talk to them. Does this view adequately explain all the biblical data? We're going to go straight into now some rather bizarre terms. These all occur in the First Testament of the Bible. We won't list out the New Testament ones because those are generally just Greek translations of the First Testament beginnings. Uh, Host test means big group or army or an assemblage of some kind. And so this concept of the heavenly host suggests there are beings living in the invisible realm, wherever that is. The Bible uses the term heavens to suggest that they are somehow higher in authority or position than the rest of us. Terms that describe the nature, that is, what they're like. And this comes from a book by the same author as Supernatural, his book titled Angels, What the Bible Really Says About God's Heavenly Host. It's a separate book, deals with these things in more detail than you and I would care to learn. First of all, the Bible does use the term spirit. Ruach, in Hebrew, uh, for example, 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23, talks about various spirits that human beings were encountering. This is also used of Yahweh, the true and living God. He is also spirit, though he's not a spirit. Rather, he's the creator of all other spirits. In other words, he's invisible. <laughs> Then we have those who are the, the so-called heavenly ones, mentioned, for example, in Psalm 89. Uh, we'll probably get to later if we don't run out of time. The uh, Mayim, being the heavens, the Shamayim, those who dwell there. The heavenly hosts are spiritual. They belong to another realm other than earth. They're also called stars in several texts, as they are in other ancient Middle Eastern cultures and religions. In fact, the religions taught that the stars that are visible in the sky are actually gods. And they're doing stuff up there, and sometimes they're causing things to happen down here. What does the Bible say about them, however? Well, the question then with stars, though, is that why astrology is so popular? People, uh, they would line up the, yes. this planet with that planet, that star, and star. That's right. There's a fundamental belief that the stars cause things to happen on Earth, and the configurations thereof. However, in the Bible, the very first chapter of the first book says that God created the stars to serve as signs and patterns in the sky. Now, we know what they are for astronomy. However, the term is used for spirit beings in some texts, which would be understood by ancient readers to be some kind of spirit being. Then we have the, the holy ones, the Chodeshim, uh, in Psalm 89 again. And then the term gods or divine beings. The two forms of this, usually plural, the Elim, meaning many El, El being the most ancient universal name for deity. El. But the Bible says there is more than one of those. There are the Elim. And then there are the Elohim. Where have you heard that word before? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It occurs over 2,000 times in the First Testament. It, it looks like a plural, but it's usually singular, except when it's talking about lesser gods, created gods. What is their status? What kind of right do they have? What authority do they carry? Let's, uh, here are some of the terms that are used. First, they are referred to often as an assembly. Other places, they're called the council. For example, in Job 15.8, an interesting question that will come up. Whom was Elohim speaking to when he said, let us create mankind in our image? Using plurals. Hmm. Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Well, that's what Christians say, but we're going to have to deal with that. Then the term congregation, ka'al, which is translated usually in the Greek version of the Bible as ecclesia, or the church. So there's some sense in which the ancient Old Testament church of spirit beings is being replaced with a New Testament church of human spirit beings. Assembly or assembled meeting, the, the mochad, which actually occurs once in the New Testament, the Hebrew term with, in Greek letters. But then there's the court. For example, in Daniel 7, the court was assembled and there were thrones were set up. And one like 
the Son of Man came and sat down on one of the thrones, and all power and, and authority in the eternal kingdom were given to him. But there was an, a large assembly or court of other beings who were there as well, who also show up in the New Testament a few couple of places. Terms that describe their function. What do these beings do? Well, here's where we get one of our most familiar terms, that of angel, malach. It means a messenger, one who is sent to. Angels are not a particular kind of spirit being. Angels are any spirit being who carries a message to another being. So this is, this is a job description rather than an identity. They're called ministers, Psalm 103. They render services primarily to God, but also to us when we call to God for help. He sends these ministers to serve us. Then in Daniel, we have these interesting creatures. Often in the English, they're called the Watchers. You know, there's another book that's not in the Bible called the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is actually quoted in the New Testament because Jewish people in what we call the first century, they read Enoch because he provided a lot of details that are left out of the Book of Genesis. Anyway, what they think were the, the missing details. And they explain in a lot of elaborate, fanciful language who these watchers were in the Bible. Think Genesis chapter 6. They're watching human beings and trying to influence their behavior. And then there is the host, that is the great army, the Tzaba and the Sabaot. In other words, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of Sabaot. Some of your Bibles this is a, a great gathering of spirit beings who will often engage other spirit beings on behalf of the deity or on, on our behalf. There are the mighty ones, the Giborim or the Abarim. These are those who exercise strength and power when God sends them to do a task. And as such, this term is also used for warriors in human armies. So we kind of get the picture, these are the warriors who act on behalf of the Creator God. They're actually mediators. This term is used in other languages very similar to Hebrew. So I, I, I took a course once in a language called Ugaritic. The, Ugarit, the city of Ugarit was destroyed in what was about 1200 BC. But the language is so similar to Hebrew that if you can read the one, you can read the other. And like going between Spanish and Italian. And I remember in my course one, the professor gave us a cuneiform. Language is written in little triangles. Maybe you've seen pictures of them. We had to learn to read cuneiform and then transcribe that into Hebrew letters or Roman letters and then translate it. And I remember one text they gave us. It took us a while as students to figure it out, but it was something to the effect that the God Baal is he who has destroyed the Viathon, the sea monster. And then he said, now open your Hebrew Bible, book of Isaiah, particular text is now reading from Hebrew. So we read it from Hebrew, and what it said? Yahweh is the great God who destroyed Leviathan, the sea monster. In other words, the Hebrew Bible is using the language and the concepts and the categories that were prevalent throughout the near, ancient Near East, but is putting them in their proper place, exalting Yahweh, the Lord. One of the functions of the lesser beings is to intercede between gods and humans. Who is the great mediator for us? Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord Jesus has assumed that task and he does it much more convincingly. All right, here they are. <laughs> Cherubim and Seraphim are the only spirit beings that are said to have wings. All the other beings, when they appear, always look like what? Human beings. That's the form they take. One of the reasons for which, I have a fascinating book on my library called Two Powers in Heaven, written by a Jewish professor, I think of New York University or someplace, a Jewish guy. He was asked the question, why was it that monotheistic Jews in the first century could so easily become Christians and believe that Jesus was God in the flesh, which was seems so contrary to modern Jewish monotheism. 
he went back, he studied the rabbis, he studied the, the scriptures, the other cultures around uh, Israel over the centuries, and he concluded that binarian or trinitarian belief was already a Jewish doctrine by the time we come to the New Testament. And to figure out that the one who came as Jesus, doing the works of God, who conquered death and came back to life, and was seen going up into the heavens, that's Yahweh, come in human form. That shouldn't be surprising. Whenever angels appeared in the Old Testament, they appeared as human beings. Except these two guys, these are foreign terms that were brought over into Hebrew. And when you look at the ancient sculptures, iconography of those ancient uh, societies, they most, almost all of them have these winged beings. And so the Bible actually borrowed that for a particular class of spirit beings who guard the throne of God, that nothing defiling or defiled can ever come close to his throne, except us, who are purified and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We can come straight to the throne of God. Heiser has a second volume titled Demons, what the Bible really says about the, uh, the evil beings. And there are more of them than what we've just listed here. Eventually we'll get into some of that. How should we think about spiritual being? Have we seen anything bizarre here today already? Okay, a few things that seem a little bit odd. Bizarre but true. <laughs> <laughs> it's bizarre but true. Okay, that's the thing. Our Bible is far more fascinating than most of us ever imagined it to be, and far more relevant to the needs of human beings than some of us formerly thought. All right, anyway, there are seven ways to think about the spirit world. Well, I, I came up with six. My grandson, Andrew, he gave, he gave me another one, which was perhaps the most important of all. Here are some approaches to the spirit world that I have encountered over the years. First one being the materialistic, meaning only what's physical or measurable through instruments is real. Everything else is, a, what's that term they use these days? A cultural construct. In other words, just a mental idea. Doesn't exist, but people pretend it does, they get all messed up with it, and they lose sight of the, of the science. For the fictional character on the TV show Bones, she's a materialist. All right, so the materialist, this is the guy who says, or the gal, spiritual beings do not exist. They're quite certain about that, even though they haven't looked in every corner yet. Therefore, the Bible is wrong, outdated, backwards, misleading. Some of us may have once held that view. Okay, uh, if that's your view here today, just stay with us. I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise, but there are other views that can be taken. For example, there are the skeptics. What would the skeptics say? Not Maybe. sure about anything. Yeah. <laughs> Except for the A skeptic might say, spiritual beings do not exist. However, ancient readers believed in them, Therefore, the Bible employs their myths in order to teach moral ideals or lessons. Jesus, who talked about gods and spiritual beings and so forth, was simply accommodating his language to the false beliefs of the community around him. Now, if you're skeptical, you're pretty sure those things don't exist, but you're willing to entertain what the Bible says, maybe just to become informed, please stay with us. Third view. This is the agnostic. Gnostic means I know. Agnostic means I don't know. <laughs> what does the agnostic say? I'm not sure whether they exist or not. There you go. We do not know if spiritual beings exist or not. But we can still learn what the Bible says about them. Fourthly, there's the mystical view. Mm. Spiritual beings may in fact exist as part of a multiverse. A multiverse, this is the idea of propounded actually by a number of astronomers over the years that the universe at least even through our telescope yeah it's there we can see it measure it detect heat wavelengths all kinds of things about it but that doesn't mean that there are not other universes occupying the same space but at such at frequencies that we cannot detect uh, however beings in those universes may be able to detect us and perhaps even visit us so they would be just so much farther advanced technologically that they maybe can even make themselves visible in some way. 
Anyway, the mystic we might say, we can consider them to be real until proven otherwise. We're open-minded. We may have some convictions, but we're free to think about a lot of things. Then there's the biblicist, the Bible believer, the fundamental, the Bible thumper. What does the biblicist say about the spirit beings? If it says it's in the word, it's true. Yes, there we go. Spiritual beings must exist because the Bible <coughs> says they do, and we believe the Bible. For many, that, that's enough. The Bible changed my life so radically. Anything it tells me, I'm going to trust. But that's not the end of it. There's a sixth view here, what we might call the religious approach. Obviously, there might be some overlap between Christians and other religious believers. But suppose that you were not a Trinitarian Christian, but you were, some, you were very religious. What might you say about spirit beings in the Bible? We know that spiritual beings exist, but we're not sure about the ones described in the Bible. Isn't that double speak? My Indian friend. They can describe their gods to me. They can name lots of them. In the Indian uh, worldview, they're not only invisible beings, invisible humans, there are also spirit beings that appear amongst humans. And so you have to be polite to everyone because you don't know whom you meet who might be a spirit of some kind. What's that word they use for that? Come on, come on. And then there is the pure spiritist. A spiritist is one who says, we know that spiritual beings exist, and the Bible teaches us who they are and what we can do about them, or how we can manipulate them, or redefine them to fit our own beliefs. We'll use the Bible's language. Is that a form of syncretism? Yeah, a syncretist would take biblical ideas, personages, spirits, vocabulary, and assign their own meanings. Do you think evangelicals ever commit syncretism? That's my main problem, understanding the Bible, is assuming it means what I already believe. Look, here's my recommendation. If you hold any of these seven views, or another one we forgot to mention, here's what I'd like you to do. Whichever position you hold, we shall learn what the Bible teaches about spiritual beings, so that we can think clearly about them and interpret the Bible more accurately. Does this pose any insurmountable difficulties for any of us? So in basic concept, here's some ideas I'd like us to be familiar with, so that whenever we mention them here together, maybe we can remember what they mean. The divine council. We use this term quite a lot. That was one of those words that we studied earlier. Divine council is a term used by Bible scholars, believing Bible scholars and unbelieving Bible scholars alike, because they're, they're talking about the, mater the biblical material and what it means, or what it used to mean. Spiritual beings that surround the throne of God with whom he communicates. In fact, the very first scripture in the very first chapter of the book will take you straight into a biblical account of God surrounded by other beings with whom he communicates who are not the Trinity, by the way, Godhead. This includes God as we understand God to be. The Godhead is the self-existent supreme being who created all others. But we're, at this point, we're not describing this in terms of unity by unity or Trinity, or quadrinity, if you'd like to put Mary up there too. All right, then spiritual beings, just our definition, non-physical or incorporeal, self-conscious living personalities. Then a third is the term spiritual realm. This, for us, this will be all spiritual beings that remain unseen to us human beings most of the time, whether nearby or far away. That is, whether they are actually living amongst us or they're normally someplace else. They don't appear to us very often, and for Westerners, they don't seem ever to appear. Although, in my travels, I have met Buddhists who came to faith in Jesus after he appeared and talked. I have met a number of Muslims in different countries who became followers of Jesus after either Jesus appeared to them or other bright, shiny beings appeared to them and said, you've got to investigate Jesus. Go see that guy who has the book. I have met Jews who saw Jesus appear to them Oh, and pagans. I've met a few pagans who saw a spiritual spirit being telling them to go investigate Jesus. All right, the last term here we should be familiar with is worldview. In popular speech, worldview is used for anything you believe. 
that I don't believe that's your world. But in scholarly circles, worldview is, a, is defined a little more carefully. Worldview is all that a community believes to be real, true, knowable, and that helps us to explain our experience of life. So this consists of a lot of unspoken presuppositions about what is real and knowable, and then that you can explain. It gives meaning to our life. And so part of the difficulty of, for Jennifer and me living in other countries was learning enough of the local worldview so that they knew what we were talking about and we knew what they were talking about. And why Africans never seem to save any money. They get it and they spend it. And the foreigners, why do you guys waste your money? But in their worldview, I kind of asked once, a little old lady told me, she said, oh, Mr. J, that was my name. Few of us ever have enough money. None of us has enough money all the time. But some of us will have just enough money part of the time. And so we invest it in our neighbors. We invest it in ceremonies and dances and baptisms, or naming ceremonies rather, and funerals. Because when we comes our turn and we are in deep need, all of our neighbors are going to come to our help. So it was their, it was their social security system, not their wastefulness. Let's talk a little bit about the gods. This is often causes us the most concern. Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you amongst the gods, O Yahweh, or O Lord? El In. Ancient languages, everybody knew it. That just means gods. Objects of worship who have power. Beings that can influence what happens to us and in our community. The powers that rule over nature. And so the Bible is asking, who amongst those gods is like you, Yahweh? Well, what's the answer? None of them. None of them. And that's written when Moses had led the people out of Egypt, and the Egyptians already believe in a multi multiple gods. Exactly. Yeah, they come out of that. And even the Jews had no reason to doubt the spiritual reality of the Egyptian gods. In fact, when Moses came and encountered Pharaoh, he did not deny the existence of those gods. What did he do instead? My God's bigger than your God. Yes, my God's bigger. <laughs> Whatever your gods can do, my God can do more. And he demonstrated that. So then when we come to the uh, Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Later he'll go on to talk about idols as being nothing. And here, it's a different word. It's Elohim. Right? Yahweh is an Elohim. As we'll find out later, this term Elohim is used of God, gods, spirits, and ghosts in the Hebrew Bible. Human ghosts. So Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh, as Dr. Heiser often puts it. No denial of their existence. Just do not approach those gods. Don't carry their name. Don't worship them. Don't serve them in front of me. If you're going to serve them, I will kick you out of the community. You go serve them someplace else. You will not have gods before me in my presence. Did Moses believe that other gods are real? Yes. Yeah. Apparently. If so, then if you believe in angels, then why do you not believe in gods? If one is just as difficult to believe in the other, why is this subject important? First, pagan gods play a role in the history of Israel. Through the history of Israel, possibly more Israelites apostated and became pagan idol worshippers than who remained faithful to Yahweh. And so understanding the Bible requires us to know that, hey, there, there's something here to be dealt with. Secondly, I suggest that other gods remain part of the belief of billions of humans to this day. I bet Mr. Majo could teach us a lesson on the spirit beings in his community. I can tell you about those in my community. <laughs> and a lot about the spirit beings in our host communities in other countries. The folk who believe in the spirit world, the spiritual realm, and are trying to deal with it daily, when they discover the Bible and the power of Jesus and the authority of his name, it is good news. Jesus himself cited First Testament Bible verses that talk about gods. Fourthly, the New Testament books also talk about invisible rulers exercising authority over the nations. One of the Greek words in the New Testament is cosmocrat, world authority. In our men's study this past week, we had this amazing verse. In the church, 
God is demonstrating his wisdom to whom? Powers, authorities, and rulers in the spiritual realm. What is he teaching them in the church? He's teaching them that they are losing their job. God has brought on some new spirit beings who are going to rule over the nations. They are you and I. Fifthly, Christians are to struggle against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. How did they get there? Why must we struggle against And how do you do that? Well, this is not a spiritual warfare, of course, but we may we come to that. The popular culture around us are then UFO sightings attributed to cosmic origins. Recently, big release of government documents and photographs and film clips over the last 30, 40 years. A lot of them have now been put in the public domain or they've been made accessible. And so there are lots of current belief that there are beings from outside of Earth that are visiting us and maybe already empowering government. Christian response or a spiritualist response is that, well, those are demons who are parading as extraterrestrial aliens. And that the UFOs, those are the sons of God of Genesis 6 that come back. Lots of stuff out there. Uh, if you ever watch the History Channel, it finds ancient aliens in archaeology. It's all bogus, but a lot of people see it and believe it. And the ancient Egyptians had electric light bulbs. You know that, didn't you? It's right there in the archaeology. Uh, Stranger Things, an online series that uh, many folk enjoy, even Christians. In fact, with Dr. Heiser, he says he never misses an episode. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, he speaks at UFO conferences teaching what the Bible says about other beings. Then some of you have already obtained or you intend to obtain Jonathan Kahn's new book, Rabbi Kahn, The Return of the Gods. All right, then Disney is now coming out with shows such as Owl House and, and Little Demon. Have you seen the pictures of Little Demon? Mm -hmm. Cute little girl demon. Yeah, oh yeah. This is uh, great stuff. Here's my favorite. The World Economic Forum's false prophet, Yuval Noah Harari. Have you heard any of this stuff? Look him up. Amazing how he can take atheism and materialism and communism and psychology and sociology and politics and he can describe to you two degrees beyond Huxley's brave new world. The World Economic Forum is dedicated to implementing his philosophies. By the way, nice, pleasant, homosexual chap who teaches at Hebrew University. Time is up, otherwise we would actually deal with Jesus' quote from Psalm 82, but we can do that another time. Okay? I hope you'll come back. So for next time, read chapter 1 in Supernatural. You can buy it here. If the high price is too high, go give us, go drop a smaller gift in the offering.